What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash pro revenge. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. Alright, this story is called, The Story on How I Got Promoted to the Director of Sales and Sales Recruitment. I've been with my current employer for many, many years now. Even though I've quit, I've come back to them. My company also has an incentive. If an employee comes up with a way to do business better or changes something that has a net benefit to the company, they get a percent of the increased profit. Over the years with this company, I have had several major impacts. Well, about a year ago, I was talking to a senior level manager, let's call him Bob, and Bob was telling me about how the company had been having an issue in recruitment and hiring of new talent of our sales division. Now, I had been in sales before and knew of the pitfalls our structure created and why senior reps would excel and junior reps would get crushed and had a really good idea on our turnover challenges. Then one night, I had an idea on how to change the sales structure of our company almost entirely, which would still retain our senior reps, but also make it easier for younger, more junior reps to find success and stability by a result of reducing turnover. I spent a good amount of time designing this plan before I ever presented it to anyone, since this was Bob's area of expertise. After many revisions and bouncing it around in my head, I called Bob and presented my idea to Bob. Bob liked it a lot. However, he had a few minor tweaks, and he brought up concerns company executives would have. I tweaked the plan and came up with rebuttals to those objections and shared my plan with Bob. I did this several times. I'd say my plan stayed about 90% original. Bob had been with our company for decades at this point, and I've known him for my entire time. So I trusted Bob would be sure to credit me. Considering my name was all over my presentation I sent over to Bob, I expected Bob to share in the love with me, should there be any. I felt like I needed Bob as an ally to make my idea work, which is why I brought him in on my plan. I followed up with Bob and he basically made it seem like my idea was rejected, that the company was going to keep on doing what it's always done. Okay, fine, whatever, crap happens, it's not the first time my idea has been rejected. Cue a few months later and our new fiscal year is starting and our CEO calls everyone to a company-wide meeting. And as I sit down to watch, I witness our CEO praise Bob for coming up with a brilliant new sales structure, strategy, and compensation plan. It is my plan with my name removed. The CEO is gushing over how wonderful this idea is and how he thinks it will benefit us greatly. I'm freaking fuming. Pissed, Bob stole my work, put his name on it, and took credit. He violated my trust and lied to me. He told me the company had rejected the idea, yet here I am watching my company implement my idea. I get on the phone with my vice president and let loose. Now, my VP, let's call him Tim, is a really good guy and I trust him. Tim is taken aback, says that right around the time I presented my plan to Bob, Bob started presenting to senior management and it was almost immediately considered a great idea. In fact, Bob knew the company was considering forcing him into retirement because they felt Bob was holding the company back and the company needed to make a change and this idea saved Bob's job. Now to give you an overview of how in-depth my plan was. Completely restructured compensation plan. Completely changed how we present ourselves to new potential hires. Completely changed our sales training to be more focused on real-world realities. Refined the sales order process to reduce workload and streamline. Did all that using current infrastructure. Each step included suggestions on how to implement the change. Bob oversaw all of this in his current role. I then asked if I could prove that it was my idea, that I had presented it to Bob, and so forth. Now, Bob and I had discussed this over email and Facebook Messenger and another chat app. I went through our emails, Facebook Messenger, and a chat app, took screenshots, created a PowerPoint, makes it so easy to present ideas, and sent it to my VP. Two days later, my vice president called and said I needed to go into a conference call with HR, my VP, and the CEO. In that meeting, we discussed the plan I had created, the collaboration I had done with Bob, and my plan to implement it. Not only that I presented the research that I had done, 
which Bob did not have access to and justified why my idea was a good idea. The CEO seemed impressed with what I had done and convinced that I was the true creator. I was then asked what I thought had happened and I straight up accused Bob of stealing my idea and removing my name from it in an attempt to further his career. I was told they would be having a separate meeting with Bob and after that, they would inform me of any future changes. A week later, my VP called me and asked me if I was offered the chance to implement my idea, would I be willing to do that? This was obviously a promotion and I said of course. Two weeks later, I get a call from my VP telling me he's coming to my location to visit me. He also tells me I should make sure I look sharp and presentable. I tried to figure out why he was coming, but he wouldn't say. Two days later, I come into the office, check my email. Now, all big retirements and resignations are announced company-wide. I see an email stating that Bob has retired. What I found strange is that the retirement date was effective immediately, and that his replacement will be announced shortly. Generally, there is a time period for a takeover to happen, and then the replacement is announced in the email, along with a brief overview of their qualifications. The time for my VP to show up comes, and in walks my VP and the CEO. We go out to lunch, and the CEO says, OP, I came to visit you because I always think it's best to give people major promotions the news in person, but I'd like to offer you the position of Director of Sales and Sales Recruitment and put you in charge of implementing your idea, to which I accepted naturally. Then I asked, is, uh, is this why Bob, uh, retired? To which the CEO smiled and said, After talking to you and talking to Bob and discussing it among senior management, it was decided that it was time for a change. Time to inject new blood into our organization, and Bob really wanted to start his retirement. So it was best for everyone. I smiled and said thank you. I know perfectly well Bob intended on working until the day he died. Well, now he's probably going to end up dying with less than he would have had he been honest. With things this big, I just, I don't understand how people can be okay taking credit from someone. Like, there have been so many times where I said something incredibly funny and no one heard it. And then someone else says it louder and everyone laughs at what that person says. And it's like, hey man, that ego boost, that's mine. Yeah, stealing someone's thunder is the worst thing you can do. I mean, there are worse things, but honestly, in this case, it's the worst. Good thing it's a pro-revenge story and everything works out in the end, and not like in r slash show no, my life is now over, I'm dying, and I'm dead. This story's called Slumlord Lost His Business Over a $300 Security Deposit. I rented a little house from a man who owned a painting business. The power was off when we came to see the property, but he assured us everything worked, even put it in the contract. The place was dirty and poorly maintained, so we negotiated the security deposit down to $300. Turns out the heat and air didn't work, along with the refrigerator and dishwasher. I asked him to have someone look at them. He cursed me up and down. He called and left threatening voicemails. He would show up unannounced and let himself in. On one of the visits, I showed him that the crawl space was flooded and was a breeding ground for thousands, if not millions, of cockroaches and mosquitoes that would come up through the floor vents. There was absolutely no ductwork, even though he claimed the heat and air worked fine. He accused me of causing the flood myself, even though I showed him the source was a pipe that had rusted through. He refused to address any problems and said, if you don't like it, then you can move. You can't pay for a bargain and expect to live in the Ritz. This man was a terrible man in general. Once he hired someone off Craigslist to cut down a tree in the rental property's yard. The man worked literally all day for the agreed $150, cut up and hauled off the tree. He came back that evening, just standing in the yard. I asked if I could help him. He said he was waiting for the owner to get paid. The owner kept replying, saying he was on the way, but he never showed up. Our neighbor told us he had punched the previous renter in the face and refused to pay him for a day's work for his company. He had bragged about renting to illegal immigrants and not having to do anything because they wouldn't sue. We had a newborn baby, so we called his bluff and agreed to find a new place to live. We left the home in much better shape than we found it. He said he would mail us a security deposit, but never did. He dodged my phone calls until one day he called to say, You aren't getting it back. You broke the contract when you left early, so go screw yourself. 
I was really upset because we were new parents and had very little money. That $300 was a big deal to us and a drop in the bucket for this man. He owned an upscale painting business and had 15 rental properties. The next week, I was online leaving negative reviews for his business when I clicked a link and noticed his website's domain had just lapsed. I knew what I had to do. I immediately bought it, then created a homepage with contact info for his biggest competitor. I emailed him from his old domain, asking him if he wanted to buy the website for $320, the cost of the security deposit plus the price I paid for the domain. He was irate. He started calling my work, threatening to sue my employer. He even contacted my parents and threatened to sue them. He left a bunch of threatening voicemails for me, saying he was going to beat me up and he knows where I live and he has my social security number. I received emails from several review sites asking if I was trying to update the contact info for the business. He must have used his old domain's email as his contact email. I didn't want to get in trouble for impersonating his business, so I did not respond. The contact info was never changed. I received a few emails from potential clients. I called him and told him about the painting job request. I gave him the contact info for one of the clients to prove I wasn't just making it up. I told him it was the last time I was going to do that for him and suggested he buy the website back in order to not miss out on any other jobs. He told me he was taking me to court. I told him I recorded his threatening phone calls and saved all his texts and voicemails. He said he was going to sue me for illegally recording him, not illegal in my state. I said, I look forward to seeing you in court where I counter sue and press charges for harassing me. And I hung up. He called back and cussed me out for hanging up on him. I said, call me back when you can speak respectfully to me and hung up again. We repeated this about five times. Each time he was more angry until the last time. He spoke respectfully and explained he hadn't gotten a single job in months. I suggested he focus more on creating a website to find business. He lost it and cussed me out again. Six months passed and he still hadn't bought the website from me. I get a call from him begging me to do the right thing and give him the website back. I told him the current price was $350. Six months later, I get another phone call. I told him the current price is $380. Eventually, he texted me to say, I went out of business. I hope you're happy. I responded, I hear having a website really helps your business. $380 and it's yours. He told me what a terrible person I am and said, Karma's a bimbo. I responded, Maybe if you stop trying to rip people off, your karma wouldn't be so bad. That was the last time I ever heard from him. The major business listing sites confirmed his business did indeed close. I renewed the domain for another two years just in case he was bluffing. Another few months later, I drove by his office to see it was still there. It was empty with a for rent sign posted. I never got that $300 back and spent money on domain registrations, but it was totally worth it. Edits, I removed pricing and domain renewal timeline because I was estimating that it was bothering people. It was in 2013 through GoDaddy. But if it really matters to you, I can send screenshots of verifying emails, company info, and the domain address. Just message me because I can't bust it here. It would break the rules of not giving out personal info. He has the receipts. <laughs> that was a good story. Landlord, definitely not a good person. Um, That rental property sounds like it was absolute hell to live in. You gotta appreciate how kind the uh, OP here was being towards the landlord, honestly. Yeah, sure, I mean, he sniped the domain from him, but still, he was he deserved it. <laughs> All he was trying to do was break even. He was not trying to profit from this. You have no idea how big domain flipping is, and once you get into it, there's people making like 20k a month from doing it. So if you know what you're doing, you can really turn a big profit on some of these domains. Alright, this story's called, I Froze My Psycho Neighbor Out of Her Apartment. In college, my two friends and I decided to find a place together off campus. We found a beautiful three-bedroom house with surprisingly affordable rent. The basement of the house was listed as a separate apartment, but as it had a separate entrance and the indoor stairwell had been blocked off, we weren't worried, and the thermostat was upstairs. Then the demon neighbor moved in. From upstairs, we could hear everything. 
This adult woman would call her mother and scream at her to pay for her cell phone bills and give her grocery money, aka Taco Bell and cheap tequila. She would scream at whatever guy she was sleeping with to bring her meth, and one day, she brought home three puppies to scream at too. We were terrified of this woman, and the noise was hell. Also, we'd been idiotic enough to sign a lease stating we were responsible for all utilities, period. Meaning, we were now financing her gas, water, and electric. But with only two months left on the lease, we thought we could just ride it out. But then she started smoking. Constantly. According to the landlord, she'd quit for good when she'd signed the lease, but for good only lasted two days. Since it was winter, the heat was running nearly 24-7, and the smoke was wafting up from the vents. Our apartment and all our belongings began to reek with smoke. We contacted the landlord because we'd signed for a bloody non-smoking apartment. He told us we lived in a state where you could technically call an apartment non-smoking, even if it shared ventilation with a smoking apartment. Screw you, leasing laws. At this point, my two roommates were heading out for a two-week vacation. They were online students while I was residential, leaving me alone in the apartment with the demon smoker in the basement. I couldn't sleep or eat because my idiotic stomach decided to react to all the secondhand smoke by aching and cramping constantly. After three days, I was a little insane. I made a plan. I checked the forecast. Lows in the 20s all week. I borrowed a friend's ultra-insulated sleeping bag, I bought one of those ski masks with the holes for your eyes and mouth, I got out my stocking cap, my silk long underwear, my woolen socks, and my down parka. I bought tea, hot cocoa, and ramen and prepared to live off of a diet of hot liquids. And I turned off the freaking heat. Day 1. She's screaming at her mother for forcing her to move into this frozen crap hole of an apartment. Day 2. She's screaming at her boyfriend, meth dealer, because he won't let her move in with him. Day 3. She's screaming at the landlord about how she's freaking freezing. Day 4. The landlord is at my door. I greet him in full ski mask, parka, stocking, caparet, looking like I'm heading out to rob Santa Claus at the North Pole. He asks me if I don't find it a little chilly in the house. I reply I'd found all the cigarette smoke a little warm. Day 5. She's screaming about the B-words upstairs to anyone who will listen, and I'm sitting upstairs clutching my car keys and pepper spray with 911 typed into my phone. She finally decides she's freaking leaving and moving in with Greg, even though he just got out for stabbing Travis and he lives in that freaking creepy house in the woods with all those butthole-biting dogs. Day 6. She's gone! I silently bless Greg. Moral of the story, there's a bloody reason the rent seems too good to be true. B.S. for those wondering, I did have a friend who worked plumbing stop by to give me some advice about how low I could go before I burst the water pipes to hell and back. Alright guys, I have a question for y'all to determine whether or not I can respect you as an individual or not. Would you rather sleep in a cold room with a blanket or a hot room without a blanket? Because here's the thing, I've slept in my fair share of really cold rooms, and you know what, with enough layers, you're fine. It's, it, it's pleasant, actually, to be bundled up with your face cold, but your body's warm, so, you know, the, the contrast makes it feel comfortable. What are you supposed to do in a hot room? Take your clothes off, and then what? You're hot and naked. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.